Hi everybody. If you're a builder and you're watching this video, one thing we want to talk to you about is the ERVs that we are using in these homes. One thing I have learned in dealing with a number of heating contractors over the years uh, in explaining to them our desire to move to building net zero ready homes is there's a lot of outdated thinking even in heating contractors. They're familiar with ERVs and HRVs, but their thinking is going back 30 and 40 years to when these appliances were originally being introduced into Canadian home building. So Gord, can you speak to us about the right way of thinking about these things? Yeah, and thank you for that because frankly, that's my history. I, 35 years ago, I was designing and building HRVs and then along came the concept of ERVs and I had to change my thinking and I'm gonna encourage others to change their thinking as well. But let's go back to the basics before we start. The, the importance of this device is the V, the ventilation. It's providing fresh air on a continuous basis. We always ask homeowners this, exactly when would you like fresh air in your home? Well, they say all the time. So we want to go back to that concept of build tight, ventilate right. We used to ventilate by opening windows. Now homeowners don't want to open their windows. So we put in a ventilation system. And what's ventilation? It's simply exchange of outside air to inside air. In this box, we have two air streams. We have fresh air coming from outside, working its way through this box and being delivered to the furnace return to get distributed to the house. At the same time, we have exhaust air being pulled from bathrooms, kitchen, laundry rooms, being pulled through this box and sent outside, out with the bad, in with the good, out with the stale stinky, in with the fresh, and we get to filter that air. Now, as that two air streams pass by each other, they pass through this heat or energy recovery, yeah, thank you, energy recovery core. So as I have two air streams, the fresh air coming in is warmed by the exhaust air going out. The two air streams don't mix, they're the exchange of heat. And in the old days, we used what was called a heat recovery ventilator, a, a device that was just able to recover the temperature difference between the two air streams. And that served us just fine back in the 80s because we weren't air conditioning. Uh, for the most part, we were trying to get rid of moisture in the wintertime. So heat recovery ventilators served us well. But what changed? Now we're air conditioning houses, certainly in this climate zone, and we're finding houses are getting too dry in the wintertime. So an ERV exactly look, ex looks exactly the same, except the core material is made out of a material that can transfer not only heat, sensible heat, temperature difference, but it can also transfer what's known as latent heat moisture. So that hot, humid air that's coming in, the, the heat is rejected back outside and so is the moisture. These devices are 70 to 80 percent effective or efficient at removing both the temperature between the two air streams and the moisture between the two air streams. So that means in summer you're ventilating your house. If you had to open a window, you would be bringing in hot, humid air. But now when you run the ERV, you're bringing in hot, humid air, but before it gets through this box, it rejects the heat and it rejects the moisture back outside. So my house is more comfortable in the summertime. In the wintertime, we're rejecting moisture outside, but if your house is getting too dry, we want some of that moisture to come back in. 70 to 80%. And imagine again, this is the kind of the culmination of all that research. This was my early days of designing these boxes. We were working on energy efficient houses. One of the uh, challenges we had, build tight, ventilate right, this is the ventilation side. So now you can go ahead and build a house as tight as you want, ventilate it, and now that you've made it airtight, you can go to that super insulation that you love to talk about. Those three important concepts, build tight, ventilate right, now you can go ahead and super insulate your houses. It's, it's a whole house as a system concept. And speaking of that whole house as a system concept, um, can you tell us the details of the cubic feet per minute required for one person as opposed to a five person occupant home or based on the bedroom? Yeah, it's really interesting. It actually came to the fore again during COVID. Uh, we were worried about our kids going back into schools and everybody said, well, the schools better be properly ventilated. Well, they have been. Schools have been properly ventilated, and new schools have been properly ventilated since at least the 80s. And the amount of ventilation per child, per year student, is 15 cubic feet per minute. Think of basketballs of air. 15 basketballs of air per person. 
hmm, that's interesting. I wonder if we should apply the same to our kids' bedrooms as we do to the school classroom. They spend more time in the bedroom than they do in the school classroom. We know that's the healthy range. So this box, these devices, are sized based on the number of people that are like to live in the house, and we use the number of bedrooms as our count. So let's do some simple math. This is a five-bedroom house. Five-bedroom house could have six people. Six times 15 equals 90 cubic feet per minute of air. 90 cubic feet feet per minute of fresh air coming in, 90 cubic feet per minute of air going out. Now you might say, there's not always five people in here. Fair enough. This has a speed control. You could run it at a lower speed to match the occupancy. But when I ask people, when would you like fresh air in your home? They always say, all the time, and then they say, but how much? And I'm able to say, ah, the studies have been done. School classrooms, 15 CFM per student. Why not houses? 15 CFM. And in fact, that's the CSA standard, Canadian Standards Association. Uh, I'm actually on that committee, and we've just rewritten a standard that confirms that 15 CFM per person is the healthy range to live in. And now you have what's really interesting is you have control, because people go, what if I'm not at home? You can turn it off. What if I'm in Florida? You can turn it off. What if I have people over? I can turn it to a higher speed. I have total control. If you don't mind, one last thing. The fresh air is coming in. It's got dust, it's got bugs. So we pre-filter the air coming in, so we have fresh filtered air, and then we deliver it into the furnace return, and the first thing it goes through is the filter on your furnace. So it's a double filtered ventilation system to maintain healthy indoor environments. And speaking of healthy indoor environments, uh, could you touch on uh, what was found in the study you mentioned uh, about allergies? Uh, yes. And uh, allergies, pollens, and, and asthma, quite asthma, frankly, sorry. yes. Um, in the early days of airtight houses, energy efficient houses, the R2000, 1982, interesting enough, people always say, are you sure those houses are going to work? The federal government committed to auditing most of those houses and I was hired as an auditor after a house had been built and occupied for a couple of years I was uh, and others were contracted to go back and uh, look at those houses make sure things were working well I was talking to a homeowner and she said um, she was really enjoying the house she said really interesting my son who has asthma has used as an inhaler not once since we've moved into the house so I wrote that on the audit um, the government came back and actually sponsored a study with Health Canada where they looked at at asthmatics in R2000 houses, super tight houses, and asthmatics in, in normally built houses, and found that statistically, asthmatics use less medication. I'm, I'm, saying, I'm not saying they're going to solve their asthma or cure their asthma, but use less medication in properly built tight, ventilated, super insulated houses. It, it, kind of powerful. That study is available still. It, it was published and it's still on um, in the archives of uh, CMHE, Canada and Housing's website. So we, we can say with pretty good authority that proper ventilation and the CSA Standards Committee has validated that proper ventilation creates a, a, an opportunity for the healthiest possible air for occupants. And Gord, uh, another thing that our heating contractor and HVAC design, our uh, engineer who designs all the homes uh, that, that they found interesting is at Landark Homes, we always prided ourselves on getting a cold air return in every bedroom. Why they say? Well, where do people spend a large majority of their time? Uh, a lot of people sleep with their doors closed. And can you speak to what the average home builder does in terms of cold air returns? Cold air returns, and, and I'm a, you know, I obviously do HVAC designs. What we want is a free pathway of air between the, the, with the supply of air and the return of air. And it is really nice to be able to have that dedication in that particular room rather than that air having to go, say, from the bedroom to the hallway, maybe mixing with other, other spaces before it gets down to the return. The, 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 common rule is the minimum requirement is at least one return per floor but it does have some really nice benefits to say especially in houses where it's five bedrooms but maybe people aren't air all the time why would we have individual supply and return to individual rooms i, I love that concept and we can't achieve it in all uh, configurations sure. based on the floor joist framing but it's an intent that you know the majority of the bedrooms have a cold air return and that way we're uh, pushing as much air as we are returning. Yes. And can you speak, Gord, a little bit about uh, how we throw the air on the ceiling? 
Yes, and we saw uh, a, the smart duct system. Uh, people often comment, where's the, where's the registers in the floor? And good news is we don't need those anymore. The, we're, we actually want to distribute the air at a high level with some velocity. It's called throw. You actually throw the air across the room to create a really nice pattern. The problem with grills on the floor, we kind of needed them because we needed to bathe the windows because in the old days, single glazed windows were really inefficient. People were uncomfortable. But now that we're using those three panes of glass, Last two air spaces, boy, now, now we can say the windows are more comfortable. We're actually more efficient, more effective to distribute the air at high level, throw it across the room so that it creates a really consistent pattern without the annoyance of, geez, that's where I want to put my coach or uh, the curtains are blowing around. So the smart duct system at a slightly higher velocity or throw to move that air around the room, it really represents a tremendous research that was done in, uh, in Pittsburgh uh, by a group called Ibicus that ensures that the the, the best airflow pattern is actually, even in cold climates, is distributed from high wall or ceiling level and throw that air so it creates a pattern of uh, distribution across the room. And uh, another thing I'd like you to comment on is the consistency of temperature across all three floors in a home like this. Um, can you touch on that for a moment? And can you tell them the story about the, the musician with the guitars? <laughs> okay, just the story. Fair enough. Um, so first and foremost, remember we said build tight? Why build tight? Why? Because warm air rises. And because warm air rises, air ends up leaving at the top of houses. Cold air, dry air leaks in at the bottom houses. When you build tight, not much air leaks out of the top. Much, not much air leaks in at the bottom, and therefore we help maintain temperatures. Moreover, because that stack effect isn't there, when we do deliver heat to a particular floor, it tends to stay at that particular level. And when you size the heating cooling system correctly, you just don't get the stratification. In airtight houses, super insulated houses, you just don't get the same temp variation that we used to see in older houses. Uh, it was very common. Uh, my grandma's house, you know, you'd say to her, is it a comfortable house? And she would say, you know, it's a quiet, cozy house. Well, that's because she had to turn off some of the rooms. You couldn't use some of the rooms in the base, in the uh, lower levels because they were too cold in the winter. In the, in the summertime, the rooms upstairs were too hot. So you ended up with a five bedroom house, but everybody always slept in the same three bedrooms. But back to your point, here we are in the bedroom, uh, sorry, in the basement. And um, you asked me to, to tell about uh, a, a fellow who had a, a bunch of uh, and antique guitars. And um, I asked him when I was doing that R2000 audit, uh, it was one of those houses, uh, do you enjoy your house? Have you seen the um, lower energy bills? And he said, I've, I've never really noticed the lower energy bills, but what I can tell you is this is a great basement. He said, I, when I got off the road, he was a musician. When he got off the road, he said, I have these 25 antique guitars. I was told that I had to keep them in a humidity controlled environment. He said, I didn't know what that was going to look like, but when I moved into this really well insulated basement, insulated floors, insulated walls, properly done, I'm able to maintain humidity levels that are conducive to my guitars. He said, so now I have daily access to my antique guitars. It just shows the value of, I'll call it house as a system, planning ahead so that we have warm, dry, um, properly, hum properly humidity control throughout our houses. And lastly, Gord, I guess one more question. Um, since many of the homes that we're designing and building today have lower level living, uh, can you compare our lower level living uh, to the average home that used to be built, say, in the 90s? Or you've, you've got some euphemisms for those basements. <laughs> well, I'll, I will just, I always ask folks, give me the four words that describe the atmosphere in most basements. And that would be? Damp, dark, dingy. <laughs> Gee, musty, musty. musty. Okay. And, and cold, so cold, dark, and, and I say to builders all the time, why, why do you build basements? Well, because it's inexpensive living space. Well, it better be inexpensive because it's cold, dark, damp, and musty. And fully, 50% of basements, this was a CMHC study years ago, 50% of basements have significant moisture issues, challenges, and basements are tough. There's no doubt about it. Basements are very difficult, holes in the ground. So it's important that we spend a little more time. And in the super insulation uh, contract, what we need to understand is basements dry to the inside. Moisture is always coming through the soils to the inside. We need to manage that moisture. And the traditional 
uh, fibrous insulations on basement walls don't do a good job of managing that moisture. Here in your basement, you've done a really nice job of applying a spray foam, vapor impermeable spray foam, two inch, tight to that basement wall to lock that moisture, to stop that moisture from coming through that concrete and into the basement. And then in front of that, you've used fibers. Fibers are very cost effective, really good insulation product, quiet. They manage moisture now just fine because they don't have that moisture coming from the concrete. And so then you've extended that two inch underneath the slab and created, I'm going to call it a really nice cooler, beer cooler, if you will. And what I'm loving is we've been on this floor for a little while and it's warm. And when you talk about lower living area, the most annoying thing is cold feet. Um, you know, I always say in my mom and dad's basement, it was built in 1954. We used to play hockey down there. That was about it. And then they finished the basement, you know, put up some paneling, and we never used the basement again. Why? Because it was a cold, dark, damp spot. You pretty much had to wear oven mitts, a toque, and slippers to, to, to play hockey or to watch TV in the basement. But now when you have truly well-insulated walls, and you have to invest a little bit in that, and I think the best investment you've made in your houses is to make this tremendous lower living area. Thanks very much, Gord. I know we've covered a lot in that one, but I thought it was worth doing it here because this is what one of the things that Gord and his company, Building Knowledge, spe specialize in, is helping builders figure out the right way to build a high-performance home. Not everyone builds this way. You could buy an obsolete home. I don't know why you'd do that or invest in that. But please, if you're watching, consider checking out a Net Zero Ready Builder near you, or becoming one for that matter, if you're a builder. Thanks.